Welcome to Food for Thought. Join us for a thought-provoking glimpse into the world of the food that we savor. Meet the women and men who are growing it, foraging for it, raising it, cooking it, and who share it with the rest of us. So we can compare these side by side with that. Oh yeah, that's my roast right there. <laughs> We're here at Sacred Grounds with owner Beth Dominic. Beth, tell me about the history of the business. Sacred Grounds was founded in 1997 by uh, Stephen and Fred Haybear. Stephen was going to HSU at the time, and so when his dad came up and visited, they just thought Arcata really needed a late-night coffee house. So they began plans to open originally downtown at the corner of 7th and F Street, and I was hired as the original dishwasher. So I've been with Sacred Ground since 1997 and worked my way up, became the cafe manager, one of the roasters, the roast manager, and then... In 2001, we moved out here to Erickson Court, and I became the roast manager out here in Erickson Court. And then in November of 2008, I bought Sacred Grounds from Fred. So now I'm the owner. Thank you. Sacred Grounds is considered a micro roaster, kind yes. of like a micro brewer, I imagine, you mm -hmm. know, for beer brewing. How much coffee is roasted here in a year, and how much goes into each batch, and why is it important to roast in small batches? Sure. Micro roaster is defined as less than 100,000 pounds per year. We roast about 80,000 pounds in a year, so we're still in the, the micro roaster category. We have a Probat L12, which means it's a 12-kilo roaster. Generally, we do 20 to 22 pounds at a time. But you do lose some of the, when you put the 22 pounds of green weight in, you lose a little bit of that water weight during the roast process and end up with about 20 pounds of a finished batch, depending on how dark of a roast you're doing. And why is it important to, yeah, to micro-roast? Yeah. Roasting is a combination of, of science and art. So being able to use the controls that we have, you know, with the temperature and the timer and a well-made machine, but then still having the roaster develop their eyes and their nose and their palate um, to be able to coax the best flavor out of each coffee bean. So that's why we enjoy having a, a manual roaster where we have a lot of control over our machine. So similar to, you know, there's some great digital cameras and some great manual cameras out there, but you need the fundamentals of how to take a picture to be able to use either one of those pieces of equipment. Equitable and fair trade is really important to you. Tell me how you go about assuring that in uh, your purchase of coffee bean. Sure. Well, it's all about transparency and it's about the true cost of production. And we think that fair trade has really gone a long way towards addressing that and making sure that you know farmers are receiving a, a fair price for their product because it's a, it's a partnership. If we have that alliance where we know that the farmers are getting paid a price that will allow them to continue to be in business, to make quality improvements on their farm, then they're going to stick with that. And, and we need that reliable supply of high quality beans. Um, so when we see investments being made back into the farm, the quality getting better, then our product is getting better. Our customers are happy and just the, the supply chain is more stable. It seems like... By buying fair trade coffee, I mean, you've been doing this all along here at Sacred Grounds. I mean, it's kind of changed the whole coffee world. I think McDonald's now sells fair trade coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big accomplishment on your part. Yeah, we were one of the first 12 roasters to sign on with Transfair to offer fair trade coffee in the United States. And we have seen some strong improvements through fair trade. And now we're kind of realizing that fair trade doesn't go far enough. It's in a way, it's like bragging that you pay minimum wage. It's like, that's a great start, but you, you need to keep going farther beyond that. So when we talk about you know, the true cost of production, with the, the Bolivian coffee that we buy, it was purchased through an auction. So there was a price discovery method where bidders around the world were saying, well, this is what we think this organic coffee from Bolivia is worth. So we were successful in placing the highest bid for that coffee, and then, you know, move on to the next stage of, well, how are we going to get that coffee from Bolivia to here? Well, there's a lot of different ways that we can package it to protect it on that long journey across some very rough Bolivian roads um, before it ever gets to a port, gets put on a boat, and, you know, shipped on that long sea voyage up here. A spoonful of the beverage, and this is the Esmeralda, and then just slurp it loud like your mom told you not to do with okay. soup. And then unless you want to get a lot of caffeine throughout the day, it's best to spit it, to spit it out. The rest of the interviews would be really fast <laughs> if, I, if I drink all this, huh? So, and then what I'm noticing is that it's just a very lively coffee. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's hitting right in the center front 
of my tongue. There's a really long aftertaste and it, it has that, that citrus and that floral, um, you know, very different from the dark roast. So I'm gonna try, you know, all three and they should, they should taste, taste similar. In that last cup I was getting a lot more of the lemon, but just a, a nice kind of honey flavor. It's oh, just yeah, a very definitely. sweet, I get the honey. sweet coffee. What is the best way to fix coffee? Is it with the percolator, the drip, the Melita, the press, or are there other uh, ways that I don't even know about? <laughs> well, it comes down to personal choice. Yeah, um, however you enjoy your coffee, that's the, the best way for you. We use um, a variety of coffee making devices at home. Usually in the morning, I'll make a French press. It's pretty low tech. You know, you just use a, a coarse grind and some hot water, let it steep for four minutes and push the plunger down and you just get this really yummy, heavy bodied, rich cup of coffee. My husband enjoys a Chemex. That's where you'll take a cone shaped paper filter, a little bit of a finer grind. And then again, it's low tech. You pour hot water over that paper cone filter. And with that one, you don't get the same kind of uh, sludge or sediment that you would get at the bottom of the French press. You know, espresso is, has been around for, for quite some time and is its own renaissance of coffee drinking. Probably most frequently, though, I do cupping, so it's just the grounds in a, in a cup. What do you think about adding sugar and dairy? Oh, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you want the pure flavor. Yeah, I do not add, you know, cream or sugar to the coffee that I'm drinking. But when we're tasting blends, we keep that in mind that how... I prefer coffee is not how our customers are going to, to enjoy it. So with a blend, does it take well to the addition of cream and sugar, or is it one where, no, it's probably not. Some of the very light roast coffees just don't go very well with cream. What's your favorite coffee bean and the method that you would prepare it? I love a wonderful Ethiopian yerga chef where you get a lot of the floral and citrus shining through in a light roast and I would prepare that in the French press. What does the future hold for coffee farmers and for you? I wish I knew the answer to that question. You know, climate change is real and the weather patterns for the past two years, it, it's the wrong weather at the wrong time for a lot of coffee farmers. So. I think that uh, roasters are going to have to start looking outside of the traditional coffee growing regions. Um, maybe some farmers that are currently in coffee won't be able to stay in coffee. But coffee is uh, an affordable luxury, so I know our customers are going to continue to drink coffee. And the challenge for me is to, you know, the best coffee is the one I haven't tried yet, so we're just going to push the envelope and keep looking for new coffees to try. and. We're willing to taste any coffee that comes across our table, so it's really exciting when we have farmers contact us and say, hey, you know, can you give us uh, your feedback on this coffee sample? And that's just been a, a really great discovery mechanism to, to find some great new producers. So you can actually uh, taste some of the coffees from some of the smaller producers, but somebody that's a big company may not be that accessible to these small coffee growers, and so you're able to give them a shot. Yeah, we're, we're in a unique position that we have the contacts, like we know where to find great coffees in, in small quantities, you know, which a, a bag's 150 pounds and an auction lot might be anywhere from 13 to 20 bags. And a, a large commercial roaster wouldn't be able to do much with that. But we can, you know, really go a long way with a, with a small lot like that. Thank you so much for taking us on this <laughs> tour of Sacred Grounds and telling us more about coffee than I ever knew was possible. This is Jennifer Bell, and I've been talking with Beth Dominant. Come on to my house and my house. I'm gonna give you candy Come on to my house and my house I'm gonna give you apple a plum and I forgot to If you have any questions or comments about this program, please call our listener comment line at 826-6089. You can hear this broadcast again at the KHSU website under archived programs at khsu.org. Food for Thought is produced in the KHSU studios located at Humboldt State University. Our engineer is Jessica Eden and producer is Jennifer Bell. Join us again next Friday on KHSU for another edition of Food for Thought during the KHSU homepage. 